hey what's good people thanks for clicking into this video this is gonna be another 20 minute reading aloud session from Carl Xiao yup as you probably know I'm a passionate reader I love reading book aloud man not just to you know practice my speaking English but I just really love to feel that energy you know when I read book I can focus better and I can feel that author's vibe. You know what I'm saying? All right, I'm gonna continue this pay this book, Influence, the Psychology of Persuasion. If you got this book, please take it out, and I'd love to read for the next 20 minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna pick a random page again because um, I'm pretty sure all these books I'm gonna read over and over, so it doesn't matter where I. I mean, I would read chronically, but the thing is, I would love to repeat the content I read before so I can just resolidate my memory and uh, get a better understanding, if that makes sense. So I'm going to read from this page, uh, 156, the many, the more we see, the more there will be. A bit earlier, I stated that the principle of social proof, like all other levels of levers of influence, works better under some conditions than others. We have already explored one of those conditions, uncertainty. For sure, when people are unsure, they are more likely to use others' action to decide how they themselves should act. In, a, in addition, there is another important optimizing condition, the many. Any reader who doubts that the seeming appropriate appropriateness of an action is importantly influenced by the number of others performing it might try a small experiment stand on a busy sidewalk pick an empty spot in the sky or on the top building and stare at it for a full minutes very little will happen around you during that time most people will walk past without glancing up and virtually no one will stop to stare with you now on the next day go to the same place and bring along some friends to look up or two Within 60 seconds, a crowd will have stopped to crane their necks skyward with the group. For those pass by who do not join you, the pressure to look up at least briefly will be nearly irresistible. If the results of your experiment are like those of one performed by researchers in New York City, you and your friends will cause 80% of all passerby to lift their gaze to your empty spot. Moreover, up to a point, Around 20 people, the more friends you bring along, the more passerby will join in. Social proof information doesn't have to be only visual to sweep people in its direction. Consider the heavy-handed consider the heavy-handed exploitation of the principle within the history of Grand Opera, one of our most venerable art forms. There is a phenomenon called clicking. Clicking. Click clicking. I don't know how to say this word correctly. Clack. Clack. Clacking. Said to have begun in 1820 by a pair of Paris Paris Opera House hab habituals named Santon and Porsche. <laughs> the men were more than opera goers, though. They were businessmen whose product was applause, and they knew how to structure social proof to incite it. Organizing their business under the title I Assurance Des Success Domatics. <laughs> All right, I don't know how to say French. They list themselves and their employees to si singers and opera managers who wished to be assured of an appreciative audience response. So effective were Sonton and Porsche in stimulating genuine audience reaction with their rigged reactions that, before long, clicks usually consisting of a leader, chef de clique, and several individual clickers, had become an established and persistent tradition throughout the world of opera. As music historian Robert Sabin notes, by 1830, the clique was a full-blown institution, collecting by day, applauding by night. But it is also altogether, it is altogether probable that neither Sonten nor his ally, Porsche, had a notion of the extent to which their scheme of paid applause would be adopted and applied wherever opera is sung. 
as Clayton grew and developed, its practitioners offered an array of styles and strengths. The play Rizzo, chosen for her ability to whip on cue, the Bisu, who caught Bis repeat and encore in ecstatic tones, and the real or fuck man, this word is so hard to pronounce it. Selected for the infectious quality of his love. For our purposes though, the most instructive parallel to modern forms can be observed in the business model of Santon and Porsche and their successors. They charged by the staffer, recognizing that the more clickers they sent to be scattered among an audience, the greater would be the persuasive impression that many others liked the performance. Click run. Opera, opera goers are hardly alone in this respect. Present day observers of political events such as US president debates can be significantly affected by the magnitude of audience reaction. Candidates perceived performances in US presidential debates have been a candidates candidates perceived performances in US presidential debates have been of no small significance in in election outcomes. As political scholars have noted their critical impact. For this reason, researchers have investigated the factors that have led to debate success and failure. One of those factors has been how the responses of audiences attending a debate have affected the responses of those observing remotely, usually on TV but also on radio and streaming video. By presenting the candidates true performances but technologically, technologically modifying the responses, applause, cheering, laughing of on-site audiences. Researchers have examined the influence of these altered responses on remote audiences' view of the candidates. Their findings were consistent. In a 1984 Ronald Reagan Walter Mondale debate, a 1992 Bill Clinton George Bush debate, and the 2016 Donald Trump Hillary Clinton debate, whichever candidate seemingly received the strongest response from the on-site audience won the day with the remote audiences. In terms of debate performance, leadership qualities, and likability, certain researchers have become concerned with the tendency in presidential debates for candidates to seat the on-site debate audiences with raucously loud followers whose effusive responses give the impression of greater than actual support in the room. The practice of clicking is far from dead. This is some serious stuff. Oh yeah, I know I knew it, but I didn't know it could be applied to literally everything, like including the one of the most important elections in the world. So, yeah, we really cannot just simply believe what we hear and what we see. Yeah, it could be manipulated and yeah just people a lot of people most of us don't even know it all right i'm gonna skip this reader's report and go to the next page 159 why does the many work so well a few years ago a shopping mall in Essex, essex how do you say that name essex england had a problem during normal lunch hours its food court became so congested that customers encountered long waits and a shortage of tables for their meals. For help, more managers turned to a team of researchers who set up a study that provided a simple solution based on the psychological pull of the many. The solution also incorporated all three of the reasons why this optimizer of social proof works so forcefully, validity, feasibility, and social acceptance. The study itself was straightforward. The researchers created two posters urging more visitors to enjoy an early lunch at the food court. One poster included an image of a single person doing so. The other poster was identical, except the image was of several such visitors, reminding customers of the opportunity for an early lunch, as the first poster did, proved successful, producing a 25% increase in customer activity in the food court before noon. But the real success came from the second poster, which lifted pre-noon consumer activity by 75%. This is crazy. Validity. Following the advice or behaviors of the majority of those around us is often seen as a shortcut to good decision making. We use the actions of others as a way to locate and validate, validate a correct choice. 
If everybody's raving about a new restaurant, it's probably a good one that we'd like to. If the great majority of online reviewers is recommending a product, we all likely feel more confident clicking the purchase button. In the shopping mall posters example, it appears that visitors exposed to a photo of multiple others taking a pre-noon lunch were particularly swayed to view the idea as a good one. Additional studies have shown that eyes presenting increasingly larger percentages of customers favoring a brand, 4 out of 7 versus 5 out of 7 versus 6 out of 7, get increasingly more observers to prefer the brand. Moreover, this is the case because observers assume that the brand with the largest percentage of customers preferring it must be the right choice. Often no complex cognitive operations are necessary for others' choice to establish the valid validity. The process can be more automatic than that. For example, fruit flies possess no complex cognitive ca capacities. For example, fruit flies possess no complex cognitive capacities. Yet, when female fruit flies feud other females mating with a male that had been colored a particular tint, pink or green, by researchers, they became much more willing to choose a mate of the same color, 70% of the time. It's not, just the f it's, it's not just fruit flies that respond to social proof without cognitive direction. Consider the admission of prominent travel writer Doug Lansky, who, while visiting England's Royal Oscar races, caught a glimpse of the British royal family and read it, read it, re-died, read it, his camera for a photo. I got the queen in focus, with Prince Charles and Prince Philip sitting beside her. Suddenly, it hit me. Why did I even want this picture? It's not like there's a worse shortage of royal family photos. No tabloids were going to pay me big money for the shot. I was no par paparazzi. I was no paparazzi, but shutters for, but shutters, but shutters firing around me like Uzis. I joined in the frenzy. I couldn't help myself. Click, run. Click, click, click. Let's stay in England for an enlightening historic illustration of the power of the many to validate a choice and initiate contagious effects. For centuries, people have been subject to irrational sprees, manias, and panics of various sorts. In his classic text, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Charles Mike K listed hundreds that occurred before the book's first publication in 1841. Most shared an in instructive characteristic contagiousness, others' actions spread to observers who then acted similar and who then acted similarly and then who then acted similarly and thereby validated the correctness of the action for still other observers who acted similar in turn. In 1761, London experienced two moderate-sized earthquakes exactly a month apart, convinced by this coincidence that a third much larger quake would occur on the same day a month later. A soldier named Bell began spreading his prediction that the city would be destroyed on the 5th of April. April. At first, scant few paid him any heed, but this, but those who did took the precaution of moving their families and possessions to surrounding areas. The sight of this small exodus stirred others to follow, which in cascading waves over the next week, week led to near panic and a large-scale evacuation. Great numbers of Londoners streamed into nearby villages paying outrageous prices for any accommodations. Included in the terrified throngs were many who, according to Mackay, had laughed at the prediction a week before, but who packed up their goods when they saw others doing so and hastened away. After the designated, after the designated, after the designated, after the designated day dawned and died without a tremor. The fugitives returned to the city furious at Mr. Bell for leading them astray. As McKay's description makes clear, their anger was misdirected. It wasn't the crackpot Bell who was most convincing. It was the Londoners themselves who validated the, his theory, each to the other. That's exactly true. Yeah. Often people just freak themselves out. Feasibility. If we see a lot of other people doing something, it doesn't just mean it's probably a good idea. It also means we could probably do it too. 
Within the British shopping mall study, the visitors seeing a poster of multiple others taking an early lunch might well have said to themselves something like, well, this idea seems doable. I guess it's not a big deal to arrange shopping plans or work hours to have an early lunch. Thus, besides perceived valid validity, a second reason the many is effective is that it communicates feasibility. If lots can do it, it must not be difficult to pull off. A study of research the st a study of residents of several Italian cities found that if residents believed many of their neighbors recycled in the home, then they were more willing to recycle themselves, in part because they saw recycling as less difficult to manage. With a set of estimated, with a set of est estimable, with a set of estimable colleagues leading the way, I once did a study to see what we could best say to influence people to conserve household energy. We delivered one of four messages to their homes once a week for a month, asking them to reduce their energy consumption. Three of the messages contained a frequently employed reason for conserving energy. The environment will benefit. It's the socially responsible thing to do. Or it will save you significant money on your next power bill. Whereas the force played a social proof card stating honestly, most of your fellow community residents do try to conserve energy at home. At the end of the month, we recorded how much energy was used and learned that the social proof based on message had generated 3.5 times as much energy savings as any of the other messengers. messages. The size of the difference surprised almost everyone associated with the study, me for one, but also my fellow researchers and even a sample of other homeowners. The homeowners, in fact, expected that the social proof message would be least effective. When I report on this research to utility company officials, they frequently don't trust it because of an entrenched belief that the strongest motivator of human action is economic self-interest. They say, come on, how are we supposed to believe that telling people their neighbors are conserving is three times more effective than telling them they can cut their bill power bills significantly? Although there are various possible responses to this legitimate question, there is one that nearly always proved persuasive for me. It involves the second reason, in addition to validity, that social proof information works so well, feasibility. If I inform homeowners that by saving energy, they could also save a lot of money, it doesn't mean they would be able to make it happen. After all, I could reduce my next power bill to zero if I turn off all the electricity in my house and cold it up on the floor in the dark for months. But that's not something I'd reasonably be able to do. A great strength of the many is that it destroys the problem of uncertain achievability. If people learn that many others around them are conserving energy, there is little doubt as to its feasibility. It comes to seem realist realistic and therefore actionable. Okay, acceptance, social acceptance. We feel more socially accepted being one of the many. It's easy to see why. Think again of the British shopping mall study. Visitors either encountered a poster showing a single shopper taking an early lunch in the mall's food court or multiple shoppers doing so. To follow the example of the first, first poster, observers risked the social disapproval of being viewed as a loner or oddball or outsider. The opposite was true of following the example of the second poster which assured observers of the personal comfort of being among the many. The emotional difference between those two differences, two experiences is significant. Compared to holding an opinion that fits with the groups, holding an opinion that is out of line creates psychological distress. In one study, research participants were hooked up to a brain scanner while they received information from others that conflicted with their own opinions. The conflicting information came either from four other participants or from four computers. Conformity was greater when the conflicting information came from the set of persons than from the set of computers. Even though participants rated the two kinds of judgments as equally reliable, if participants viewed the reliability of the two sources of information as the same, what caused them to conform more to their fe fellow participants' choice? The answer lies in what occurred whenever they resisted the consensus of other people. The sector of their brains associated with negative emotion, the amygdala, became activated, reflecting what the researchers called the pain of independence. It seems that defying other people produced a painful emotional state that pressured participants to conform. 
defining a set of computers didn't have the same behavioral consequences because it didn't have the same social acceptance consequences. When it comes to group dynamics, there's an old saying that gets it right. To get along, you have to go along. Take, for example, the account by Yale psychologist Arvin Jennings of what happened in a group of heavy smokers who came to a clinic for treatment. During the group's second meeting, nearly everyone took the position that because tobacco is so addicting, no one could be expected to quit all at once. But one man disputed the group's view, announcing that he had stopped smoking completely since joining the group the week before and that others could do the same. In response, he, his former comrades be, in response, his former, in response, his former comrades banded against him, delivering a series of angry attacks on his position. At the following meeting, the dissenter, the dissenter reported that after considering the other's point of view, he had come to an important decision. I've gone back to smoking two packs a day and won't make any effort to stop again until after the last meeting. The other group members immediately welcomed him back into the fold, greeting his decision with applause. This twin, this twin needs to foster social acceptance and to escape social rejection help explain why cults can be so effective in recruiting and retraining members. An initial, an initial showering of affection on prospective members called love bombing is typical of cult induction practices. It accounts for some of the success of these groups in attracting new members, especially those feeling lonely or disconnected. Later, threatened with this threatened withdrawal of that affection explains the willingness of some members to remain in the group after having cut their bonds to outsiders. As a cause, as a cause invariably urged, members have nowhere else to turn for social acceptance. All right, this reminds me of the documentary Tiger King. Uh, those weird old men who had a cult and um, yeah I don't know if you guys ever watched that documentary on Netflix it was crazy um, anyway I just came I just came to a realization that I mean it's not the realization but it's just more like a idea that I gotta make whatever I'm doing trying to do um, much cooler and be accepted by some more opinion leaders and you know by doing so uh, more people especially younger people would find it cool to you know go to bed early and work out and run and read books like what i'm doing right now like i want to make it cool because this is this is very beneficial i'm telling you reading books is very beneficial it changed my life it's like the brain food and a lot of us have never read books in their entire life i mean i was not a big reader uh, but uh, I always know the importance of books and I really, you know, just took the time and, you know, developed this, you know, lifelong habit. I'm going to definitely promote this reading habit with all I got. And yeah, so hopefully I can really influence more people to, you know, start reading. And yeah, so this is it. And uh, I'm pretty curious who is still watching and please leave a comment and let me know and um, what can I do better or what do you like or whatever you think and just let me know all right thank you for your time have a great night bye